we can uh, open back to the book of Romans, chapter 2. We're going to finish chapter 2 today. Again, studying the last two verses, but this will be a quick lesson. Maybe not. <laughs> There's always a lot more in the scriptures than sometimes we take at face value. Right. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. He says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Amen. If you recall, going all the way back to verse 17, Paul had been showing the things that the Jews trusted in, things that they thought they did and did well. But then the following verses, he shows them their <coughs> hypocrisy and their insufficiency in those things. If we're not careful, we'll become the same way as the Jews were, thinking that we're really doing something for God and we're not. In verses 25 to 27, he shows how circumcision has no power in of itself without the law, just you know, much like today baptism has no power in of itself without the gospel. Amen. <coughs> And here we're still discussing the Jews versus Gentiles, and he says, For he is not a Jew. He was referring back to verse 27 and 26, where he, speaking of the uncircumcision, which is by nature, the he who fulfills the law and keeps the righteousness of the law. That person, he said, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. That's in the physical sense, because these are Gentiles by nature that he's referring to. Mm -hmm. you, you and I, the, the natural citizens of Rome versus the Jewish citizens. That he who keeps the law, really through Christ, as we'll, if you recall from our lesson last week, that this person who has righteousness, who has the righteousness of the law through Christ, who fulfilled the law in the person of Christ, who had that person, he says he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. A little bit. There's a lot of emphasis in the Jewish religion placed on being a Jew outwardly. We'll get on that a little bit later, but God's grace is not exclusively for one race or nation or group of people. He says, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. The circumcision here, where he says it's not the outward circumcision of the flesh. It's not it was the physical circumcision which the Jews had as a sign of the covenant. Right. For, at this time, it was not practice for the Gentile people to be circumcised. Yet, the focus that Paul is bringing out here, and as we'll see in the next verse, is that it's not the outward man that's what matters. It's the inward man. Amen. See, one could be circumcised. One could be a Jew by nature. One could have been a Pharisee. Uh, you know, Paul, I said, he had much to boast about in the flesh, but yet he said he counts that all but dumb. Amen. All those outward showings of the flesh did not matter when it comes to have you been born again or not. Amen. Just being a Jew cannot save one. And circumcision of the flesh does not change the heart. Right. I think that sometimes the Jews seem to lose sight of that. And our modern Christianity, sometimes we do the same type of thing. We think just being a, a good Baptist will so be sufficient. That's not what saves a person. Amen. There's many denominations that think that Baptism will change them, but it doesn't change a person. So it's not the the outward, but the inward man that what makes a difference when we if we are saved or not. Amen. You go on. Let's go over to Luke chapter three. Let's look at a few places here where the the Jews trusted in the fact that they were Jews. 
Now the scripture shows them, shows that they were not right with God in that thinking. Luke chapter 3, verse number 8 here. John the Baptist has been preaching before Christ had started his ministry and John was preparing the way. Verse number 7, we'll go ahead and read that too. It says, Then said he to the multitude that came to be baptized of him, O generation of lifers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Amen. Notice verse 8, he says, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. And he, he was a Jew, so he knew exactly how the Jews were thinking. And he says, And begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to let these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Amen. It says, it doesn't matter that you're the children of Abraham. It says, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. True repentance means a whole lot more than whether they were Jews or not. True repentance means a whole lot more than if they're a Baptist or not today. So, I, well, I certainly don't believe that the Catholic Church and all our daughters are the Church of God, but we shouldn't put too much stock in being a Baptist. Right. But have we experienced this true repentance? Do we, have we ever brought forth fruits worthy of repentance, or do we just say, yep, I'm a, I'm a sovereign grace Baptist, so I must be right. Mm -hmm. well, let's go over to Luke chapter 16. I know we all know this particular passage. The rich man and Lazarus. Let's go ahead and read. Let's read the verses 19 through 24, the gist of this. But I want to notice one thing in particular here. Verse 19 says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And his iron to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and see that Abraham was far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And notice verse 24 here. It says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Notice he cries out for Father Abraham. Right. And being a Jew didn't save him, did it? That's it. There I afraid there's many that sit on the pews of good sound churches and yet one day they'll be just like this rich man, lift up their eyes in hell. You're right. Amen. You just being a child of Abraham wasn't enough to save the rich man. And being a, a child of a good Christian or going even just attending a sound church will not be enough to save you today. Amen. If we go over to John chapter 8. We'll see another example here. Where the Jews really trusted that they were the children of Abraham, weren't they? They were the chosen people, and in a physical sense, the Jews were the promised people. They were the chosen nation, and really all the seed of Abraham fell under the promise that was given to him by God. That yet spiritually, that didn't do them much good, unless they been spiritually changed, then just being physically a child of Abraham didn't matter very much. John chapter 8, verse 39, we see here the Pharisees answered back to Christ, and so they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. He has said unto them, If he were Abraham's children, he would do the works of Abraham. Amen. See, they may have been physically the children of Abraham, but they certainly weren't serving the God of Abraham. We can jump down to verse 44. He tells them who their father really is. 
and says, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father he will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no such, there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Amen. See, spiritually, their father was the devil. Mm hmm. No. Of a physical nature, they were apparently the children of Abraham. They descended from Isaac and Jacob and so on down to their current fathers, but yet gene genealogy doesn't matter in salvation. Right. Amen. I know me and Brother Larry both enjoy genealogy, but and it's interesting, but who your ancestors were won't make a difference whether you're saved or not. That's it. Amen. But the Jews trusted in who they were, weren't they? And yet that was not enough to save them. Just the same today, it doesn't matter who your physical parents are, that will not save you. It doesn't matter what your, this is a hot topic, identity is today, that will not save you. Amen. It was whether you're in Christ or not, that was what ultimately matters. Your father... God, Jehovah, or is it the devil? That is what will make the difference. There you go. We didn't, I didn't read that, but in that same passage, they claimed that God was their father. Christ showed them they weren't right about that either. Mm -hmm. Just being a Jew outwardly wasn't enough to save, and neither is just being a Christian outwardly isn't enough to save one today. Right. Lots of people claim the name of Christian and you know, they may go to church, they may even try to be a good person, quote unquote, but yet there's been no inward change, they've never been truly born again to begin with. Let's go back to our text in Romans here, Romans chapter 2. And we says this person here, they're not a Jew outwardly, but he contrasts that in verse 29 and says, but he is, but he is a Jew. And you might say, well, I, don't, I don't have any Jewish genealogy in me. Not that I'm aware of, but yet, if you've been saved by the grace of God, you are a Jew, spiritually speaking. Mm -hmm. so, I know Brother Larry's traced a lot of his genealogy, and I know a lot of mine, because I've never found any trace of mm -hmm. Hebrew or Jewish the sense anywhere. I'm quite wholly Caucasian. <laughs> Yet, Scripture says that I am a Jew, and we all are Jews if we have truly been born of the grace of God. Right. Amen. Let's go over to Galatians chapter 3, Paul. Here, to the Galatians, it addresses a lot of the same things as he does in Romans about. Judaism and the law and circumcision versus uncircumcision. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. So after he has told them that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ and, and how it pointed us to Christ. Now that we have faith in Christ, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. All he says is in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither Bond nor free, neither male nor female. Well, that doesn't mean that there's no gender roles or identities today. <laughs> right. But as far as salvation and standing in Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, whether you're Jew or Gentile. So notice what he says in verse 29, Galatians 3. He says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. In Christ, we are the seed of Abraham. So that, that doesn't mean that we will physically transform into a, a Jew when one saves us, when God saves us, but spiritually we will become that. And he says here, he is not a, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And inwardly we will have all of the things which the Jews should have had outwardly. Mm -hmm. Instead of just an outward show of righteousness, believers have a true spiritual righteousness. Instead of just an outward possession of the law, we have the 
Holy Spirit to guide us in all truth. Well, I like what, what Gil wrote on this. He says, speaking of the he which is a Jew inwardly, he says, who has an eternal work of grace upon his soul, who has not only an outward name, but an inward nature, not the law of God in the hand, but in the heart, not an external righteousness only, but internal holiness, and who is not a mere outward court worshiper, but a worshiper of God in the spirit and in truth. That's the difference between one who is a Jew inwardly and one who is a Jew outwardly. Right. When he says, he goes on to say, and circumcision is that of the heart. Well, this doesn't mean a literal circumcision of the heart that you're not going to crack your chest open and snip off a piece like physical circumcision, but in the spiritual sense, as it says in the next part here, and circumcision is that the heart and the spirit. Right. Amen. And it's the spiritual heart, the center of, of all of our spiritual life. Looks like the physical heart is the center of our physical life. I'm sure Brother Larry and others that are more trained in medical medical field than I am can say that once the heart stops beating, you're dead. Mm -hmm. You might have a little short time to resuscitate somebody, but very long without the heart beating, you're not coming back. Right. The physical heart is the, the center of physical life, and the spiritual heart is the center of spiritual life. And by nature, man has a a corrupt heart. We get God, That's it. God, God gives a new heart, as we'll see later. Always, the heart in the Jewish culture was often seen as the, the seat of our passions and our emotions and our desires. It's ultimately what controls a man. And that needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. It needs to be circumcised, as it's here said. that. This circumcision is to really to promote purity, is to show our consecration to God, much like the outward circumcision was for the Jews. It showed that they were separate from the people of the world, the false gods that were in the lands around them. So spiritual circumcision or circumcision of the heart, as it's called here, is to show our separation from the world spiritually and our separation from the false gods of this world. Amen. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10. The circumcision of the heart is not just something that Paul invented when he was writing to the Romans. It's mentioned all the way back here in Deuteronomy chapter 10 as well. Go ahead and read verses 12 through 22 so we can get the whole context here. <clears throat> it says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require thee? Deuteronomy 10 12. But to fear the Lord, or to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all of his ways, to, to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heavens and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. The earth also with all that is therein is. Only the Lord has delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Amen. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regards not person nor taketh reward. He does not execute judgment, for he doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger, and, and giving him food and raiment, loveth therefore the stranger, for he were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. He is thy praise, he is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Amen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons, and now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. Amen. Right here in the midst of all this, the scripture where it's declaring how great God is and how good he's been to Israel and how they are to serve God. He says right there, verse 16, 
16 circumcised, therefore the foreskin of your hearts will be no more stiff necked. Mm hmm. Bad. The Jews were, as we saw in Jesus' day, and at this time they were a stiff necked people, very arrogant and stubborn people, weren't they? Mm hmm. And they, they boasted that they were the people of God, that they had the law, that they had the commands, that they they were God's people, but yet they were very arrogant about it. Yeah. He tells them to circumcise the foreskin of their hearts, that they might not be stiff-necked, they might not have this stubbornness and arrogancy about them. And to therefore serve God. And the circumcision of the heart will change one's nature, will change one's outlook. Amen. We, by nature, will are an arrogant people, boastful people, proud people. Yet right. Circumcision of the heart cuts all of that out. You're right. If I have a a very hard time believing anyone that says they've been born again and yet the grace of God has never affected their life. Right. Amen. It's over and over and over throughout the scriptures we see that there is a change made to that person. Right. The heart is circumcised here as we see that they're born again as Christ told Nicodemus. So we'll turn over to Ezekiel 36 and we'll see God gives a new heart. Skipped ahead of myself just a little bit, but it said there back in our text that this circumcision was in the spirit, and not in the letter. It wasn't just an outward show of the flesh, but rather it was an inward change of the heart. Ezekiel chapter 36. You know, under the old covenant, we could call the letter here. <laughs> Worship and the commandments, they were largely a ritualistic in nature and external in nature. But we see under the new covenant, it's much more of a spiritual nature. Amen. The Jews, they had the literal temple of God that first Solomon built, and then Herod in the day of Christ. And under the new covenant, we're told that our body is the temple of God. Mm -hmm. That's just one example, but many other examples of just like circumcision was an outward show in the flesh under the old covenant, and circumcision under the new covenant is an inward change of the heart. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27. Here he's speaking of the Jews when they, when God will turn back to them, but he does the same for us. He says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Amen. Here's another reason why I say that a person who's truly been saved will have a change in life. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that you'll not struggle with sin or fall and fail at times, but yet you can't convince me that you can be saved by the grace of God and it just not affect you at all. Because as our text says, you will have circumcision of the heart. As our verse here says, it will give you a new heart and a new spirit will put within you. Amen. That is a total transformation of who you are as a person. No longer will you have that hard heart that is cold and indifferent to the things of God. No longer will you have a, a spirit which is contrary to the spirit of God. No longer will you be proud and arrogant in, the, in what you are, but rather if you've truly been seeing grace, you will know that it's all of God. Amen. 
which kind of leads us into our last point here in our text, back in Romans chapter 2. After he says that circumcision is out of the heart and in the letter, or in the spirit, not in the letter, he says, Whose praise is not of men, but of God. Amen. And this is referring to the one who was a Jew inwardly, his praise is not of men, but of God, he says. Just as a side note, some seem to think this is a this phrase here is a play on words because if you're familiar with the term Jew, it comes from the, the tribe of Judah, which means praised. Mm -hmm. And that was a praised tribe in the land of Israel. They were the one that was more faithful to God. And they were the ones that of Christ had born in the flesh of the tribe of Judah. Right. Yet our praise as a, a Jew inwardly, as a believer in Christ, is not of man, but it's of God, he says. Because all of this work, all of salvation and circumcision of the heart and a new heart and new spirit, all that is the work of God, not of man. Amen. Therefore, God is worthy of all the praise and not man. So you yourself can't be praised because you didn't do anything to, to earn it. You're right. Even the preacher can't be praised because he did not work it effectually in your heart. Amen. And contrary to the way the Jews thought their parents and ancestors can't be praised because that's not what saves a person. We can say with Jonah, salvation is of the Lord. Amen. And therefore, all the praise around it belongs completely to God. Praise is not to be of men, but of God. Amen. He, in all these verses we've been looking at the last several weeks, Paul has pointed out the things the Jews trusted in and showed them how the, those things were insufficient. It all comes down to really one question, have you been born again? That's it. Have you been made a new creature in Christ? Do you trust in Christ or do you trust in these external things? Mm -hmm. That is what will make the difference whether you were Jew or Gentile, whether you grew up in a Christian home, or whether you grew up in an ungodly home. It doesn't, none of those things will make a difference. It's have you been saved by the grace of God? That's it. Yeah. And we're chapter 3, we'll look at what we're going next week. And Paul still talks about the Jews and he begins the chapter with what advantage didn't have the Jew? Certainly there was advantages to being a Jew, but in Christ, that is not our identity anymore. It's not. It was just, are you in Christ or are you not? We'll go ahead and close with that thought. <laughs>